This is Discern Realities, a Dungeon World podcast. My name is David. And my name is Jason. Our first segment is What Happened Here Recently? Jason, what happened here recently? So I wanted to talk about the end or the finale session of uh, a series I was running in the Red and Pleasant Land um, OSR setting. Now, I took a lot of liberties with the setting, and I added a lot of elements that are not in the setting. It has the basic overall vibe of a Red and Pleasant Land, right? Um, which is kind of Alice in Wonderland with vampires. Yeah, I got to play a few sessions with that and, and run a few as well. Oh, that's right, yeah. Um, so we had the finale. Um, we had a confluence of circumstances that forced us to only have two players at the table. Um, and so I was a little bummed out about that because I had like this really great, like final, like, or at least this idea of where I thought the final session was going to go, you know? Mm-hmm. But I went, I went forward with it and it was, it was awesome. What I want to discuss was I really love it when I think Dungeon World more so than like, say, Dungeons and Dragons gives you a lot of room to have, like, very, very, like, high-tension cinematic storytelling, okay? Because it's so narrative-focused, and you're not so concerned with, like, totally predictable mechanical results. You you have a lot of, like, room to sort of play with things a little bit, and and so you can kind of build a natural sort of tension because you're really just telling a story, right? You're not really engaging with, like, lots of dice rolling and stuff. So the situation was this. Only had two members of the party, okay? They are on their way to destroy the, the big bad of the series, who was this, uh, he was there called the Red Bishop, Belak Voskaya, okay? And uh, they believed him to be a vampire, but uh, it turns out he was not. So the final encounter with Belak required them to go underground, and they were in this um, this rather large space, but it was very dark, and it was so large that their torchlight didn't even fully illuminate the space, so they didn't have a good sense of like how big the space really was, right? But we had this great sort of like little three-way storytelling thing going on between me and the two players, where we saw these two these two characters like slowly, cautiously walking deeper and deeper into this large cavernous space, this dark cavernous space. And eventually they started to light more torches and just drop them along the ground, okay? And so they're dropping torches along the ground and they're going deeper and deeper into this really big space. And as, the, as they're dropping torches, they're getting a little bit more light, right? And so um, that triggered a discern realities and they were able to learn some things. But essentially what they started to figure out was that the space was just really cavernous and huge, right? Like really big, as long as a football field, uh, just as wide and like with a ceiling that was like stories high. Okay. So they started to get really concerned. Like what, like this is really, uh, like what's about to happen, right? <laughs> Meanwhile, the villain Belloc is talking to them the whole time. All right. I originally started selling it as he's like projecting his voice, right? So you're hearing his voice, you know, like, it's projected out so it sounds much bigger, you know, and, and, and you can hear him wherever you go. And so he's kind of taunting them a little bit and kind of, um, well, not really taunting them, but kind of trying to probe at them and figure out what their intentions are, you know, and, and that kind of thing. Eventually, uh, Belloc makes a move and he sends a fireball, uh, screaming out of the darkness. This fireball comes at them. Okay. And is a D and D style fireball. So it's like a little tiny glowing marble of, of white hot energy that will blow up into a big fireball once it reaches a pre determined point, right? That's a classic, uh, wizard spell fireball, right? One of the characters who's kind of like a, uh, fighting monk character, he like did like a little, wheelhouse kick to like knock the fireball off trajectory and send it flying and he and he did and he sent it flying and it exploded in midair this big huge fireball and in the in the flash of the brief flash of really bright light from the fireball they got like a glimpse of belak Vizcaya, right and all they saw like in front of them was i just described like the glint of red scales and teeth as large as swords okay and then they, that's when they realized they're like, Oh shit, this is a dragon. Like this is not a red bishop vampire. This is a red dragon. And so they're deep into this room with this red dragon, like just like right in, not basically right in front of them. Right. And so they were like, they, they were suddenly like, there was like all this tension at the table. Like, Oh shit. Like what are we going to do? You know, it's just the two of us. Like we can't handle this. And it was exciting. Uh, they couldn't really run because they were already so far along into the into the space that the dragon could have just torched them, right? And um, so they had a weapon that a special magic item artifact weapon that they thought they'd be able to kill it with, and uh, and so they tried, you know, <laughs> and um, they failed. 
the um the the monk character was killed instantly when the red dragon uh snapped him oh. with his tail yeah um <laughs> snapped him with his tail and it cracked like a, I, I described it sounding like a like a shotgun going off you know uh killed him and then uh but the but the halfling thief made a go for it he like um, he used the attack against the monk to try to like run up, uh, run up the dragon's back and jam this, this artifact, this, this nail called stigma, uh, into the back of his skull. Um, he failed as well. <laughs> um, oh, no. the, the, but the dragon, but he freaked the dragon out. And so the dragon's like, you know, like Belloc is like, just like lighting the whole space up with fire, you know, like trying to like shake the halfling off. And he did shake him off. And, um, and the halfling was there on the ground having been shaken off. And uh, having dropped the, the the artifact that would, would kill the dragon and his companion there dead, um, and he ran, and uh, and that was the end of the session. Him running away from the dragon, right? And so it was so, it was so good. Like I can't emphasize like uh, enough like how, how much I was enjoying it. I don't know about the players. I had a really great time with it. I thought it was really fun. Um, the the character who died got a really lovely black gate send off, and I think I think the player was satisfied by that. He actually got the seven and nine result and made the choice that he thought was right, which was to actually go beyond the black gate. It was just a terrific uh, finale. It was a terrific scene. Um, it was so evocative, and it just had this like slow build to it that I really loved. That sounds like so good, so good. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was a situation where. I kind of knew it was going to go south for them, you know, and they started to figure it out too, but they, but they were pretty game at a certain point. They're like, you know what? This is, this is what the situation is. We need to just figure this out, you know? And, um, and I hope they enjoyed it as much as I did because I really quite enjoyed like watching their faces, you know, and watching them like have the, the, the dawning realization of what was happening and how they'd been kind of tricked and trying to figure out like how to, how to proceed. And then, and then of course we had this really, really nice black gate scene, um, for the character who, who died. So, uh, yeah, it's good. Wow. Good, good finale. Yeah. It's like huge. Oh man, that sounds like a great finale. I, I've played a lot of dungeon world and you know what I've never actually encountered in character? A, a dragon. A dragon. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't happen often. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, that, I, don't, I don't have anything to say beyond that. I just thought it was kind of a cool thing. Awesome. Thanks for sharing with us. Let's move on to the next segment. Our next segment is What Should I Be on the Lookout for? Jason, what do you have for us this week? Funnel World. Funnel World is a terrific, terrific uh, Dungeon World, eh, Dungeon World adjacent product, I guess. It's a, it's definitely like a sort of a hack of the, the you know, the main Dungeon World text by Jason Lutz. Um, we've talked about his uh, Perilous Wilds um, stuff before. Uh, Funnel World was something he created before that. Uh, I've run it a few times. It's really terrific. What it does is it tries to do the the OSR style zero level character funnel, like you might find, um, in say dungeon crawl classics. So you have like a bunch of zero level characters and you put them through a meat grinder dungeon basically. Um, and then to see who comes out on the other side, right. And, and how they do in the dungeon and, and how and the sort of things they discover in the dungeon that has a bearing on like what kind of, like ultimately what kind of like proper level one character they become, you know, thief or wizard or fighter or whatever. Right. Uh, funnel world does that, but for dungeon world, it's it you it basically has you making um a gaggle of of i don't know if the gaggle's the right word but like a bunch of <laughs> a bunch of like peasants a big bunch of peasant zero level peasant characters and so everybody at the table might have three or four characters each right and uh you put them through this funnel and they um they have terrible stats because you roll them in very classic like you know old school style like just straight 3d6 with no like modifiers or choices or anything you just roll the numbers and you often end up with you know they're not like they're not like competent characters like you know level one dungeon world characters are they do have this special sort of funnel world move related to like their their peasant profession or whatever which can be helpful uh but in in general though they're pretty weak they have if they're lucky they have four or five hit points you know (laughs) um the reason, one of the reasons I really love Funnel World, it ends up being quite quite a comic game. Um, it, it has a very like just comedy sort of happens because these characters they go down into the dungeon or whatever the circumstances are. They're in this dire, deadly circumstance, and all they have is like one item related to what their profession was. Yeah, as a peasant, yeah, okay? I I love it because I remember when we were playing like. You know, you've got like the barmaid and the the rope maker and the herdsman, and they've got like right, yeah. the herdsman's got like three sheep and a stick. And <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. the rope maker has a bunch of rope. The rope maker has <laughs> a bunch know, of rope, yeah. which 
was my char- one of my characters, and she didn't even have enough strength to carry all the rope, so I had to right. That's right. Yeah. I had to get someone to help. <laughs> Yeah, you had, your your rope was too much for your your weight your weight bags. So yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, I love it. Um, one of the things I really enjoy about it, it like I said, it, it does end up being quite funny, which is a bit of a change of pace, you know. Um, but also, I really love the creative constraint of like having to do things with such in within like within these like really uh, rather extreme limitations, right? Like you got these characters who are very very fragile and who are not super capable. Uh, they might be good at their one thing though, and they have their one item. They have their pig or whatever, right? <laughs> they have their, they have their, they have their like candle wax because they were candle makers or whatever, right? And, and it's kind of fun to watch the players like w- within that creative constraint, like try to solve problems, you know, uh, with those, with those limited options. So, yeah, but it, it's fun. It, it's a really cool thing. It's a, you know, it's pretty short. It's got lots of fun tables. Making the characters is a blast because you just do it. Like you roll a bunch of tables and you end up with just, just some randos, you know? So yeah. it's, it's cool. I don't think I have anything else to add. Let's just go ahead and move on to the next segment. Our next segment is what here is not what it appears to be. Uh, Jason, I understand you want to talk about OSR modules uh, at Ray Otis's request. <laughs> uh, yes, our friend Ray asked us a question uh, today, in fact. I've actually had people ask me this before, too. Uh, not as like directly and specifically as Ray did, but other people have asked me this just kind of you know in passing, which is how do I go about running osr modules in dungeon world and what are the sort of the trade-offs of doing that and stuff i talk about that a lot well just this episode i talked about running a red and pleasant land right that's an osr thing i love to run dcc modules i love to run lamentations of the flame princess material uh in dungeon world but but ray's questions were you know how do you do that but still give players like the ability to help create the story ideas and then also when I do these, when I run these modules, do I bother with converting all the monsters ahead of time or do I just kind of do it on the fly? Same thing with magic items and stuff, particularly like OSR type magic items that just kind of have plus one bonuses and stuff. Like he was basically asking like, what do I do about all that stuff? You know, like I, it sounded like his question was mostly like, how, how much do I actually sit there and convert to dungeon world? Right. Do I go page by page and room by room? Right. <laughs> right to make the dungeon <laughs> fit. Right. But, and, and also this other question of like, you know, what about like, you know, giving the players like some input into the story. So my answer is as far as like player input into the story, this module thing works pretty well for me personally, just because of the way the gauntlet organizes games. So I don't have a regular group of players from week to week necessarily. I might have the same group for like, you know, two or three sessions or four sessions, but then I might have a completely different group. Uh, you know, after that, I don't have the same group carry over, uh, regularly. It's just a, it's just a, a feature i think of how the gauntlet does business right it's a very open very big very public group so i have to kind of be very flexible and have to run adventures uh within a much tighter uh, and tell stories within a much tighter uh, number of sessions and so i don't really have the luxury of doing a lot of like Ooh, let's have a session where we just wander about and build the world, right? Um, because I may only have three sessions, right? So I have like a little bit more pressure to, to have like an actual, like, you know, full story arc take place within three or four sessions. And so a module works great for that because it, te- you know, because it's got a beginning and an end, right? Now, having said that, I do run, I try to run the first session using kind of like the dungeon starter format that we talked about a couple episodes ago. Right. Mm. And so what I, and that, and that, and that kind of plays into how I con- quote unquote convert the modules. So what I do is I don't go room by room in the dungeon, uh, in the module and like, and like map out every single thing. I used to do that. I, I've done that before. Um, it's a, it's a mess. It doesn't work well. What I've landed on in recent, you know, times is, to just do the Marshall Miller style dungeon starter, but using the module as my inspiration. So I go through the module, I find, um, I find the bits that I like and I make up questions, you know, I make up questions related to, to the dungeon. And, and I, and those are kind of my questions that I ask the players, you know, to help fill in some of the details, right. And particularly the details of like why they're there at the dungeon and that sort of thing. I use the, uh, the descriptions in the modules for the lists of impressions that usually go with the dungeon starters, right? So I have like a nice little running list of like just, you know, evocative details I can pepper in there. Um, I do make a list of possible treasures and I do convert them to dungeon world. So I find like, uh, normally between like three and six like key magic items or, or key important items in the module. And I do a full conversion to dungeon world for those. So if they're just like, you know, if it's just like a, 
a boring plus one sword or something, I'll, you know, I'll take the, I'll take the description of the sword, but like, but give it like a, you know, something a little bit more narrative and interesting for Dungeon World, right? But, but basically, I, I do my best to kind of just convert some of those things. I find a, one or two things in the module that like would be really cool set pieces or interesting things to do, and I make those into custom moves, okay? So for example, like when I converted this module called the Croaking Fane, one of the things that happens in the dungeon uh, is the characters can, can find this like silver tablet called the Infectious Instructional. And um, if you touch it, it, it causes you to have this terrible disease that blood tadpoles rip out of your body. Oh, God. Yeah, a swarm of like blood tadpoles. Anyway, um, so I, I made like a custom move related to that, right? So if they if they do find this thing or if they find someone infected by it, like how does that, how do we translate that into a custom move for Dungeon World, right? So I did that. And then importantly, I also do some threats, okay? I'll make, I'll find like the big, the big bad thing in the dungeon. In the, in the module, it might have have like a real specific sequence of events that triggers it or makes it happen but for dungeon world purposes i translate that into a multi-step uh, threat with grim portents and in croaking fane there's this like large like toad statue which is kind of like a golem and it will attack it'll attack the characters but only like when they're leaving the dungeon or if they do certain things in the dungeon i translated that to be um a grim portent style you know danger but that didn't have like specific like geographical triggers. It was just like, it was just like a Grim Portent style. Like, oh, the eyes of the statue light up, you know, next step. Um, you know, you hear the grinding of the stone as it comes alive or whatever, right? That kind of thing. So not, not, not triggered by particular incidents in the module, just like, you know, something I can push on as a Grim Portent, like if, the, if a six comes up or whatever, right? So that's what I do. I essentially take the module and I, boil down I boil it down in my mind to the 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 really key interesting things about it and and I make that into into custom moves and dangers and and questions and impressions I essentially make a little dungeon starter for each one so awesome yeah that sounds great have you ever run into one that you're like there's no way I can translate this um no <laughs> nope <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I haven't because because here's the thing the things like another thing that Ray asked was like how do I choose and I just honestly I just go with whatever looks interesting to me and if if a module looks interesting to me it's because there's something about it that that I think is would be really cool and fun to do in Dungeon World and so so you know oftentimes these are like heavily adapted and and they end up playing out nothing like the actual module right but uh, but they still have the flavor and they still have a lot of the character. Have you ever subjected players to heavy metal music because a module intended it to be that way? Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> Were you there for that one? Yeah, I was there Frost for that Doom? one. Okay, yeah. Actually, actually, Death Frost Doom is actually that's one of the very rare. Uh, I actually did do a full conversion of that, and I, I, I kind of wish I hadn't. Honestly, I wish I had just done like a little bit more, like what I've just described. What's uh, what's the one that you have the most love for? The one that you've converted that you love the most. Oh God, that's a ter- that's a hard question. I, I I did like Death Frost Doom a lot. Um, I do I do like that Frog one a lot too. Um, Red and Pleasant Land is fun because it's not really a module; it's more like a setting book. But it was kind of fun to go through and pick out like just like big picture elements from it that I wanted to express in Dungeon World. Um, and and it was a challenge. You know, it was really quite a quite a nice challenge. Um, on that, yeah, that's all I got. Yeah, that's all the questions I've I, I really had about it. Let's move on to the next segment. Our next segment is what here is useful or valuable to me. I've got three classic magic items today. Okay, now I say classic magic items; they're not classic. They're only classic by my measurement. <laughs> so, what does that mean? Cla- like, <laughs> well, so they're classic. They're my classic magic items. So they're classic in the sense that I've run. Uh, well over 300 sessions of Dungeon World, probably more, and I mean, easily 300 sessions. And these three magic items are kind of like my old faithfuls, my standbys, right? They're not like super powerful artifacts. They don't even have like really strong narrative ties to anything, but they are just cool items that um, are kind of fun to watch the, the, the players use. So the first one is called the Kerberos coin. Uh, the Kerberos coin is marked with the stamp of three head, the three-headed hound Kerberos. Um, this coin is the currency used in the lands beyond the Black Gate. 
so long as the coin is pressed into your hand, uh, you automatically take the 7 to 9 result on your last breath roll. No roll required. Uh, the coin disappears when and if you return to the mortal coil. So the idea here is that if you're part, if someone falls uh, and you can get this coin in their hand, or if they have the coin in their hand when they when they drop to zero hit points, they can choose to take the to automatically take the seven to nine result instead of rolling. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, uh, it's just kind of like a little a way to kind of stave off death, which is particularly helpful because I run a really deadly game. Uh, C uh, dragon that killed monk in one blow. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, from from earlier. Um, I, I run a pretty deadly game, and so this is kind of one of those like nice like little pressure release things. Um, I always the the way I always like roll this out to players is they find a skeletal hand clutching the coin, which is supposed to hint that this person like their hand got severed, their hand that had the coin in it got severed, and so they didn't get the benefit of having oh, the, the Kerberos coin. Gotcha. Right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I've gotten I've gotten a few of these I think in in various sessions. The second one I've got is called Chain Lightning in a Bottle. Very proud of my little joke there. Uh, Chain Lightning in a Bottle is a bottle coursing with static energy with little sparks of electricity dancing behind the glass. When you remove the stopper, you roll plus con. On a 10 plus, a bolt of lightning will leap from the bottle and strike a target of your choice for 1d10 damage. Pretty powerful, right? The bolt will then jump to four more targets of your choice. The second target, the second target suffers a d8. The third suffers a d6. The fourth suffers a d4, and then the fifth target suffers a single point of damage. Um, all damage ignores armor. Each target can only be struck once. Now, so that's the 10 plus result, right? You basically get to hit five people with this light, this, this chain lightning, right? Um, it gets progressively weaker, but you know, in a, if you're surrounded by orcs, this could fry a bunch of orcs, right? Um, on a seven to nine, it's the same as above, except each additional target after the first target is chosen by the GM and can include yourself or your allies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So on the seven to nine, it works, but you, you, and you get the, you get the benefit of the first hit, the D10 hit, but then the rest after that is up to the GM. So nice. that's chain lightning in a bottle. And then finally, um, there's a, there's a series of classic magic items from D&D, um, the brazier of uh, summoning and commanding fire elementals, the bowl of summoning and commanding water elementals, and so forth. There's one for each of the major four elements. Um, I have these items. Uh, I'm going to do the brazier of fire elementals, but they all work the same. When you burn some sacred incense into the bronze brazier, you roll plus charisma. Going back to my uh, my whole thing where I like <laughs> to use charisma for summoning purposes and, and invoking pur- purposes, right? Right. Um you can make that wisdom if you feel have strong feelings about it, but I do charisma. On a 10+, plus, a fire elemental is called forth and will do your bidding for a short period of time. Um, it's at the GM's discretion, usually a battle or a scene, um, after which it will return to the plane of fire. On a 7-9, to nine, same as above, except the fire elemental will only do your bidding momentarily before returning to the plane of fire. So you just get to use it briefly. On a miss, uh, the fire elemental rages with anger at being summoned and will attack you mercilessly. <laughs> so, that's a um, that's a gamble <laughs> that's a gamble yeah i know what listeners should have figured out by now i love i love risk reward moves so yeah that's it just three pretty straightforward items um very evocative of of like sort of classic D items yeah yeah definitely this seems like something straight out of you know straight out of one of those modules Stra- or something straight out of the back <laughs> straight out of the back of the dungeon master's yeah, guide right yeah back so, of the book yeah. i think that's it for this segment let's move on to the next one our next segment is what is about to happen okay so we're continuing our comic strip ap featuring the adventures of ramshackle crow now last episode ramshackle and urbina had uh found a chest that we believe contains the heart gem that ramshackle came for and uh they are now making their way out of that room back down the the trapped tunnel Uh, they know where the traps are so it's no big deal but they're making their way back down the tunnel to go find the mirrored egg that Urbina is here to get. So this is your the deal that you guys came to. So I think we'll start from there. Okay, great. So you're walking down the hall. Urbina has decided to kind of take the lead as you guys make your way back. Um, all the traps are there. You know, you guys know where the traps are and she knows where to step. Right. I mean, I'm holding this chest. It's, you know, if, if anything's coming down the way, I, I want her in front so she can have a weapon out. Yeah, exactly. And also, um, you know, we're, you're kind of going after the thing she came to get to now, right? So she's, I think she's just sort of naturally taking the lead right now. Uh, questions. What are your thoughts about Urbina at this point? So, like, just, just as you, as you see her kind of like stepping ahead and, uh, I just like to get a little bit, a little bit of like insight into what you're thinking. Yeah. So honestly, now that, 
now that Ramshackle has the thing that he came for, he doesn't feel like he needs to stick around that bad. But at the same time, he f- he kind of believes Urbina. He kind of believes that she doesn't quite know what she's doing here, and he feels like a little bit like protective of her because she like tried to poison him and failed, and then would have stepped on a trap, and then didn't know how to pick a lock, and he's kind of feeling like maybe he needs to take her under his wing, but at the same time, he feels she's a little bit insufferable and a little bit pretentious. I'd like to know a little bit more about like kind of where Ramshoko came from. Like, what was it like in your early career, right? So how Ramshackle, I guess, like got his start is, you know, he was a, he was a cut purse. He was like, you know, eight years old. He was an orphan. He didn't have anyone. And there was like, there was this man who like was kind of running an orphanage, but not really. It was more like he was using all of these orphan children to like steal things. And that was how they got to stay. And so he's like bringing them up in this craft of, of being a thief. Uh, what was his name? His name was Catspaw Patterson. Oh, that's a good name. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I think he he was raising these kids to be thieves. And then one day, like, he got caught and he got hung. And so from then on, like, the orphans were on their own. But fortunately, um, I was, you know, uh, developed enough that I could, in my craft, that I could make my own living. Until one day, I uh, I encountered another thief who captured me. Uh, doing the thing that I was doing, I was basically ripping off a whole bunch of like poor people, and he uh, and he brought me in under his wing, and he was the original, or at least a ramshackle crow, and I took his mantle when he passed. Awesome, cool. Uh, you're caught up in your reverie, thinking about ramshackle the third, or whichever ramshackle <laughs> he was. Yeah, no, who knows how many ramshackles there were? <laughs> who knows? Uh, you're kind of caught up in your reverie when. Urbina spins around and kind of puts her arm over your chest and presses you both up against the wall. Okay. Like she saw something, right? You're very near the end of the corridor, almost to the central area that, that, uh, that connects the other, the two different corridors that we've described. Um, she says, she kind of holds her finger up to her lips and says, and then she motions and you see that there in that, uh, in that big connecting room at the end of the corridor, um, is one of the temple uh, priests in the silvery white robes, okay? And it's a little unclear what he's doing, um, but uh, he's definitely, like, looking around. Like, he, he, he must have some sort of sense that uh, someone's someone's here, or, or um, maybe he saw that the secret door um, up above was molested or something like that. But what do you do? So it seems like he's looking around. I'm going to just try and keep an eye on him and see if maybe he's gonna he's gonna go away maybe you're you're very flat up against the wall and as long as you stay underneath the torch like where the shadow is you know because the torch light goes out in a certain angle um or a certain array he may not see you but um i'd like to know like what you do specifically to make sure that he if he just like kind of pokes his head down the hall he won't see you guys you know like it seems like this isn't going to go great. I think I'm just going to ambush him. And here's what I'm, here's what I want to do. Um, I want to like find like a, a loose stone fragment or something nearby. Um, and then I'm going to throw it past him so that he hears it and looks that way. And then I want me and Urbina to, to jump him. Sounds good. Do a defy danger with intelligence for quick thinking. All right. And I got the middle result. We were just talking about this last episode. <laughs> weren't we? The rock. It uh, definitely distracts him, and you will definitely be able to sneak up to him uh, as you as, to try to jump him as you planned. The problem, though, is that you're going to get up close to him, but that's when you're going to realize that there's someone else coming down the stairs. I throw it, and Gerbina hangs back, and I rush forward because I didn't like have time to like tell her this is what I'm about to do. So I throw it, and then I run up. And and I grab the guy around uh, around his shoulder and around his neck, and I put my knife to his throat, and I see I see the the shadow of someone else coming down the way, and I pull him quickly to the side of the door. So as soon as that whoever's coming gets through the door, they're going to see I've got a hostage. Nice. And I think we'll end it there. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> 
so that just leaves our final question. Who's really in control here? That would be the Gauntlet Gaming Community. We can be found on Google Plus by going to the community section of Google Plus and searching for the Gauntlet. We also run dozens and dozens of games at all times. There are so many games on our calendar on Gauntlet Hangouts. You can find a link to Gauntlet Hangouts from our community. We're also on Twitter at Gauntlet RPG. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jason. Thank you, David. Thanks, listeners. That's our show. Mm -hmm.